We'll start with cross-country flight planning. Um, you have been using for flight, yeah. which is considered an electronic flight bag. Mm -hmm. um, is that a legal means to navigate? Yes, since they pull up the charts from the FAA. Yeah. What are you not allowed to do with an electronic flight bag? That can't be like your primary use to fly. Essentially, it's just like a secondary means of use to fly. Right. So it can't it can't replace navigation. Mm -hmm. So GPS, VOR. Yeah. Um, it can't replace radios. Yeah. Yeah. Or anything like that. Can't be like your primary controls, essentially. Right. So yeah, like your flight instruments not going to replace it. it. Can't replace navigation. Yeah. Um, the wording is you can use it for situational awareness mm. and to replace anything paper. Got it. Really, so like your charts, chart supplement, mm -hmm. um, and your POH. Yeah, stuff like oh, that. POH is in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I asked you to prepare a flight from John Wayne to Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. Very scenic Bakersfield. Um, <laughs> so do you have that nav log with you? Yeah. It's right here. All right, so we'll just take a look at this. Um, so starting off, where it says altitude, mm -hmm. how did you determine that altitude for this flight? So the arrows up means my climb. Uh, 6,500, I took that number based off of my uh, magnetic course that I'll be using. So that falls in line with the western side of it. So anything from 180 to 359 degrees, and this falls in that mm -hmm. based off of what I have in here. And because it's on that side of the spectrum, it needs to be even plus 500. So I chose 6,500. Also because I'm going through the Bravo and considering the coastal route requires me to be at 6,500. So I just kept it there and also elevation. So elevation also allowed me to be at 6,500. Great. Um, and before that, this course, mm -hmm. how did you arrive at that number? <clears throat> so I drew a line. So for the, from the first point to the Huntington Beach Pier, I drew a line with my plotter on a tack. And I used the, what is that called? Plotter. The plot, yeah, the plotter. <laughs> the plotter, uh, the course side of it. And I drew it out and I got the relative or almost approximate heading of it. And same thing for the other ones too. So from Huntington Beach Pier, to uh, the Vincent Thomas Bridge and LAX Polar Pass and so on. Yeah. So you mentioned magnetic course. What, what's the difference between magnetic course and this number that you have right here? So magnetic course would be my true course corrected for um, magnetic variation. Mm -hmm. So on a tack in that specific area was about 12 degrees to the east. So knowing that, it's uh, minus to the east, so minus 12. So this number here was my true course, so 250. And then this first one was 11 since it was closer to that line. So I chose 11 there and just kind of did that. Good. So when you said magnetic variation, what is that referring to? Magnetic variation is the difference between magnetic north and true north. Okay. And the magnetic deviation is corrected for whatever our compass is, right? What's ever on that placard. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you mentioned with the climb rate, or the, the climbing portion of this cross-country flight, how do you determine your climb rate for that? The performance section of the POH would give me those numbers. Yeah. Um, for your descent profile, how did you get to that number? So... At a comfortable rate of a descent would be about 500 feet per minute. So I would, let's just say pattern altitude there is about a thousand. So I would have to do 5,500 divided by the 500, which would then give me about 11-ish minutes. So 11 minutes. And then because of the calculations for me to figure out like how far that would be, I would then have to divide 11, the 11 minutes by the 60, which would give me give or take 0.2 
and times that by a relative speed of 100 knots just to kind of make things easier. That kind of give me about 20 nautical miles, give or take, to make my descent. So about 20 miles before the airport, I would start making my descent comfortably at 500 feet per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where your top of descent would begin. Yeah. At that point. So just as a side note, like always mark that on your charts. Most mm -hmm. people overshoot their top of descent. Yeah. And then looking at your compass heading, how did you get to that figure? So I first started with my true course and I corrected that for the wind correction angle. And from there, it then led into my true heading, which then I corrected for uh, variation. From there into the magnetic heading, then I had to correct that for deviation from the compass card located in the plane that I'm flying. And I ended up with that number. Okay, great. And these legs right here, how did you determine that distance? So the distance between, so from John Wayne to the Huntington Beach Pier, same thing, I took my sectional, or my, uh, my plotter, and since I was using a tack, I used the, in, the inner part of it to figure out the distance between each leg specifically, mm -hmm. and that gave me my leg distance between each one. Okay. And then the, so there's your leg, and then your ground speed, how did you arrive at that ground speed? So my ground speed, I used my uh, E6B for that, and I just kind of inputted everything and turned the wheels and got my ground speed based off of the E6B information. Yeah. So what's, I guess a little more detail about that, what's determining your ground speed? My... The, oh, so I would first take my climb uh, speed, which would be VY, mm -hmm. that I would that I take out of the POH, and from there, I would start out and um, use that information in the E6B. I would take the so course. How about, how about just like cruise, like your cruise ground speed? Oh, how did I get to that? Or what, yeah, what affects that ground speed? Oh, wind, mm -hmm. wind, yeah. And then your ETE, how did you de determine that? So I would take the I would, the ground speed and distance, I would divide those numbers and that would then give me my uh, estimated time and route for that specific leg. And your fuel burn, how did you get to that one? So the fuel burn, I got that number out of the POH, same thing, perform a section of that. And I used the altitude at which I'll be flying at and just kind of, I know that 6,500 6, is not specifically in there. Mm -hmm. so. I went to the closest number and I just took that fuel burn and I added that in there. And same thing, I just took my time, divided that by 60 and then multiplied that by, by the gallons per hour and I ended up with those numbers. Yeah. Right, that's time divided by 60 times gallons per hour. So for this cross country flight, how much fuel are you gonna burn total? About 11 gallons. And assuming it's a day VFR flight, how much fuel are you required to have when you arrive at your destination? I need about 30 minutes reserve to have. Yep. And so what does that mean as far as gallons for you? So 30 minutes. In terms of gallons, like how many gallons of gas do I need? Mm -hmm. So if that's gallons per hour, gallons you need 30 minutes of that. So 30 minutes, about about four gallons, four and a half. Yep. And if the flight were at night, how much would you need? I would need 45 minutes of reserves, so about six and a quarter. Yep. Yeah. So what I would do too, is for the future, especially like your check ride, mm -hmm. um, Navlog, have your fuel total, including your startup taxi, which you got right there. Yeah. Um, include that, and then add your 30 minutes, or actually add your personal minimums. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then be able to talk to that, say, well, the minimum is 30 minutes, but my personal minimum is 45 or 60, whatever it is. Got it. And so I added 60, so I need... An extra eight gallons. Yep. Got so it. you said this was 11, right? Yeah. So 11 plus 12.4. 12.4 plus the eight, it's about 20 gallons is what yeah. I need left. Yep. Yeah. So you can't... Okay. So hold yourself to that. It's like, oh, I can't depart unless I have at least 20 gallons of fuel. Got it. So how do you determine you have 20 gallons of fuel? I would then do, take the fuel stick mm -hmm. and put that into the tank, lift it up, 
but it has to be correct. It has to be the specific one to my aircraft. So if it's like for like a Piper, that's not going to work. Right. So I have to get an actual 172 fuel dipstick and measure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody's that nitpicky. Mm -hmm. Well, they'd be like, well, how do you know you have 20 gallons? And somebody says, well, I look at my fuel gauges. Mm -hmm. Fuel gauge won't always be accurate. Yeah. You can't trust that. Well, I, I look inside my tank. How do you know what 20 gallons looks like? Yeah. Well, yeah. I have full tanks. Well, how do you know it's full? Because an inch in your fuel tank could be difference between five gallons. That is very true. Because it's so wide. Mm -hmm. Like just a little bit of height difference in your fuel yeah. is actually a lot. Yeah. Because like you're only seeing this much. So just because you see like an inch lower doesn't mean that the rest of it is not the same. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely sense. dipstick for sure. Like yeah. I said. Great. So based off the information we have with your nav log, weather, do you feel like you can complete this flight today? Yes. Uh, based off of the pave checklist that I would follow through for myself. Mm -hmm. So I would so pilot myself. I would then go into the I'm safe checklist, which illness, good. I'm okay. Uh, medications, not taking anything. Am I stressed? No, I'm good. Uh, alcohol, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, let's see, F, uh, fatigue, not tired, got an eight hours amount of sleep, and then uh, emotions, feel good, nothing's going crazy through my head. <laughs> uh, and then back to PAVE, um, aircraft, double check the aircraft's airworthy, you know, everything's good on that end. Uh, the environment, environment can mean a number of things, so we could go into NW crafts, so I would check NOTAMs. Um, I would then check the weather, the known ATC delays to see if there's anything going on with ATC. And uh, let's see, NW crafts, okay. Runway lengths, I would check the lengths of the runways, double check that, you know, I even have enough runway in the event of anything. Uh, craft A. Alternates, so I would just double check for alternates, um, make sure that I can even get to another airport in the event that airport's closed or anything. Uh, fuel, make sure I have enough fuel in the aircraft and um, take off and landing distances. So then from there, external pressures, I'm okay. Nothing's pressuring me to do this flight. Mm -hmm. I'm not pressured to do it myself and should be good. So that's my go decision. Great, so let's go fly. All right.